heard Eddie Chumney live. Is there anybody here? Awesome, awesome, good, you're in for a treat. He is with Hebraic Heritage Ministries and he has been around for a long, long time. So if you would, let's welcome Eddie Chumney. Test, oh good. All right. <clears throat> well, shalom everybody. And welcome to Revive 2023. And I'd like to thank everybody for coming because there wouldn't be a Revive without you coming and supporting the ministry. So thank you for your efforts uh, to come. And you know what's great about Revive is once a year, we have an opportunity to get together and get connected with people that we've met over the years. And really, Revive to me, and I think to many, it's come to be like a family reunion where you get to see people that you haven't seen all year. And there's so many faces that I've uh, come across and say, hi, how are you doing? Uh, how's things going? And so I, I pray that you'll enjoy your weekend here and enjoy the conference. So I'd like to begin my uh, teaching by saying it's a privilege, joy, and honor that Yeshua the Messiah has given me to be able to be here with you this weekend and to share with you a series of messages which he's put upon my heart to share with you. And without Yeshua, I wouldn't be here. And so I want to thank him and acknowledge him for him making it possible for me to be here. That being the case, I'm going to be sharing a teaching that I have entitled, Why Was Yeshua Called a Nazarene? And in giving this teaching, I want to share with you who Yeshua is in a deeper way, in a deeper understanding than perhaps uh, you have had of him previously. And so why was Yeshua called a Nazarene? And the title of this message is based upon the verse in Matthew chapter two, verse 23, where it says he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. He shall be called a Nazarene. So why was Yeshua called a Nazarene? That is because the things that he taught and the things that he did was associated with Jews who were living in the Qumran community and who produced the Dead Sea Scrolls. And only by studying the Dead Sea Scrolls will you have an understanding of who these people were and what they believed. And so in the day, there were three primary sects of Judaism. You had the Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, and you had those that lived in the Qumran, and the historians called those who lived in the Qumran as Essenes. However, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's no mention of the word Essenes. And so they were known, they called themselves the Yahad. They were a covenant community. And Yahad is the Hebrew word that means oneness or togetherness or unity. And so they were led by priests. And these priests were called the sons of Zadok. And so their belief system was different from the Pharisees. And if you read the Dead Sea Scrolls and read what they believed, their belief system lines up 
with what you understand to be faith in Messiah from the New Testament, from the New Covenant. And so they were very influential in um, establishing for us the New Covenant faith that we try to follow. And so uh, this winter, um, I decided I wanted to study the Dead Sea Scrolls because I hadn't ever done it before. So I read 15 or 20 books on the subject related to the Dead Sea Scrolls so I can get a comprehensive understanding from a variety of perspectives about who they were, why they were there, and what they believed. And so what I'm gonna be sharing in this teaching and then a couple more sessions in the breakouts is what I learned and discovered from doing these studies. So what I'm gonna be basically presenting to you is material that I learned and gleaned from the books, from my study sources. And so um, I need to properly give credit to my study sources of where this information is coming from. So I have here a um, number of books by which I'm gonna be sharing with you the presentation. And so, like I said, I need to acknowledge my sources and give proper credit to my sources. So instead of mentioning the book on every slide, I wanna upfront tell you the book so I can just go faster through the teaching. And so, um, the one book from the title of the message is based upon is called uh, Jesus or Yeshua. Yeshua, he will be called a Nazarene. I actually forgot to bring that book. Um, but here's a book, The Dead Sea Scrolls by Michael Wise that actually contains all the, the scrolls and the fragments, 600 pages. Um, this book, uh, Between the Testaments, Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Essenes by Robert Jones. Uh, this book, The Dead Sea Scrolls Today by James Vanderkam. Um, this book by Josh Peck, The Lost Prophecies of Qumran. Then uh, Jesus, the Essenes, and Christian Origins by Simon Joseph. Uh, the Ancient Order of Melchizedek by Ken Johnson. The New Covenant of Damascus by Ken Johnson. Uh, the Sons of Light by David Gaston. Uh, the Three Temples by Rachel Elior. And then the Ancient Testament of the Patriarchs by Ken Johnson. So all these books you can presently get on Amazon. So I'm not here to promote any particular book, but these books are available for you to study on your own. So that's my way of giving acknowledgement and credit uh, to my sources. And so that being the case, let's uh, get on to the teaching. And so you're gonna be seeing the slides on each side. And so um, I'm gonna be sharing pretty much going over the information in the slides. So it's from uh, Matthew chapter two, verse 23, where we have the scripture that says, he will be called a Nazarene. So the usual interpretation is that Yeshua, Jesus, though born in Bethlehem, was raised from childhood in Nazareth of Galilee, and for that reason, he was called a Nazarene. Nazareth was his hometown. His followers were known as Nazarenes, because they were disciples of the man from Nazareth. Nazarene is understood to be the label of a resident of Nazareth. Even the lexicon graphers agree with this interpretation. For the Strong's lexicon, the Greek number 3480, it says it's an inhabitant of Nazareth. However, first, Nazarene is not the name used for a resident of Nazareth in either Greek or Hebrew. In Hebrew, the term is Nazarati. The Greek translation or transliteration would be something like this, and it gives the Greek. These Greek renderings retain the T or the TH, which is the last letter of the name of the town of Nazareth. This rendering is also in keeping with Greek translations or transliterations of references to residents of other towns in Israel, 
which have as their last letter a TH. For example, the Septuagint, the standard Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, renders the Hebrew name of the town of Gath, the city of Goliath, and it uses the TH when it comes into Greek. And so those who lived in the Qumran area, the historians called them Essenes, but they called themselves the Yahad, and their leadership was the sons of Zadok. Now, many or most of them ended up, because of their belief system, ended up believing in Yeshua as the Messiah. And when they became believers in Yeshua as the Messiah, they were referred to as Nazarenes. And they were also called the people of the way. And so we're told about Paul in Acts chapter 24, verse 5, that he was the leader of the sect of the Nazarenes. So while Paul grew up as a Pharisee, he became identified with the sect of the Nazarenes, which is another sect among the Jewish people at that time. So here I want to show you where uh, Matthew 2.23 says he would be called a Nazarene. Here, the word Nazarene is uh, translated using the Greek uh, Strong's number 3480. But when it says that Paul was a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, it's the same Strong's number. So um, in Acts chapter 24, verse 5, it translates it as a Nazarene. And it's the same Greek word that got translated as a Nazarene in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 23. And so in Matthew chapter 2 verse 23, it says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, that he will be called a Nazarene. But there's no specific prophecy in the Hebrew scriptures that says the Messiah will be called a Nazarene. So why is it says that it might be fulfilled, which was written by the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene? Because the Hebrew root of Nazarene is Nazar. And it's from the root Nazar that we got the Hebrew word branch. And so the Hebrew word for Christian, if you go to Israel, is Notsri. Notsri from Nazar from a branch. And so basically Nazarenes means they're the branches. Their name is the branches. They were a branch of a sect of the, what the historians called the Essenes who lived in the Qumran. They were the, the branch that believed in Yeshua as the Messiah. And then there's a verse that's often overlooked. This is Acts chapter six, verse seven. And it says, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So who are these priests that believed in Yeshua as the Messiah here so early in Acts in chapter 6? Well, were these priests of the Pharisees? Were these priests of the Sadducees? Well, they had to come from the Qumran community. And the leadership in the Qumran community, they were priests. They were Zadok priests. They had become believers in Yeshua as the Messiah. So the Dead Sea Scrolls expect, expected Messiah to be a branch. And this is found in 4Q161 based upon Isaiah in chapter 11, verse 1. So in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, it says, A shoot will come forth out of the stalk of Jesse in a branch will grow from his roots. And so this passage is understood to be a messianic passage. So those in the Qumran were expecting the Messiah to be a branch. And so in Acts chapter 24, verse five, once again, it says about Paul that he was of the sect of the Nazarenes. Now I'm going to show you a couple scriptures 
where it is a reference to Yeshua being from the town of Nazareth. And one of those is Matthew chapter 21, verse 11. Another one is Mark chapter one and verse nine. So we do have scriptures that speak of him being from the town of Nazareth, but Yeshua in his teachings and the things that he did, um, those who witnessed what he taught and those that witnessed what he did, when we had the three main sect of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the historians called them the Essenes, but they lived in the, the Qumran. Those that witnessed what he did, they identified him and linked him and associated with the particular sect that lived in the Qumran. And so we can see how Yeshua is linked with the sect um, of the Nazarenes. Mark chapter 16, verse 6 and this is a detailed explanation. If I go into all the detail, I'm going to run out of time sharing you the whole totality of the message. Um, but it goes into the Greek, and it shows you how uh, the Greek uh, should be rendered. Um, you seek Yeshua the Nazarene. The American Standard Version translates Mark chapter 16, verse 6, as you seek Yeshua the Nazarene. John chapter 19 Verse 19, as well, uh, should be rendered as Nazarene. And then Acts chapter 22 and verse 8. When Paul's giving his uh, testimony about what happened to him on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, um, he says that Yeshua said to him, I am Yeshua, and some translations say of Nazareth, but the Young's literal translation translates it as, uh, he said on them, I am Yeshua, the Nazarene. So Yeshua was associating himself with those who lived in the Qumran, who had a particular belief system, and many of whom ended up believing that he was the Messiah. And so the Jewish historian Josephus mentions that there were two branches of the Essenes, those that lived in the Qumran. So I'll use the word Essenes when I'm using what the historians referred to them as. And the Christian father Epiphanes uh, mentions the Essenes or the Nazarenes and his work Panarian, in Panarian chapter 29 verse six, he states, that the Nazarene sect was before Messiah, and at one time this sect did not know Messiah. And also the Essenes may have branched into three sects. By the time Hippolytus of Rome described these different beliefs compared against those of the Pharisees, Sadducees, in the Jewish religion in chapters 13 to 25 of book nine of the refutation of heresies, he says three sects had branched off from the traditional or the original Essene group. And they didn't just live in the Qumran, they lived throughout the land of Israel. So although Qumran is undoubtedly the best known of the Essene communities, evidence exists for the Essene groups in Egypt, Damascus, and elsewhere, especially in the land of Israel. That the southwest section of the Second Temple area, Jerusalem was known in those days as the Essene Quarter. And so what happened as time went on, in the very beginnings of the faith, after the day of Pentecost, the early Jewish believers in Yeshua as the Messiah we are told in Acts 6-7 that there were many priests that believed, but a, a lot of the Jewish believers in Yeshua as the Messiah uh, were from the Essene community. But then what happened to them? Well, as the faith in Yeshua went out into the non-Jewish world, into the Greco-Roman world, Greco-Roman Christianity buried them. And also the Pharisees, came known as rabbinic Judaism, 
um, because they didn't believe in Yeshua as the Messiah and their belief system was in many regards opposite of the Essenes, they buried them as well. So we lost who they were and what they believe and their influence in the early days of the faith. And if it wasn't for the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls, today we wouldn't have a very good understanding of the early Jewish believers in Yeshua as the Messiah. So Yeshua being called a Nazarene, those who witnessed his teachings and what he did, they linked him with the Essene community in belief. Now, of course, we know Yeshua wasn't a member of their community. He got what he taught from the Father. But in trying to identify, well, who are you? Um, what do you believe? When they, you know, um, generally people was going to say, well, I'm a Christian because I believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. Yeah, but, you know, what's your particular details of your belief? So they want to label you and give you a name. So the label that they gave to Yeshua was a Nazarene. So in the book, The Sons of Light, he says the following. I am truly thankful for my Christian upbringing, glad to have been brought up to read the wonderful and varied collection of Jewish literature we know as the Old Testament and consequently to appreciate the Jewish foundations of Christianity. However, I had been taught that there was a great silence in the years between the completion of the Protestant Old Testament and the birth of Messiah. I now find that position to have been challenged beyond breaking point. After Malachi, there is a 400 year gap until the beginning of the New Testament. When we read the book of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, we discover that the conditions in Israel are quite different than those where we left off in Malachi. Israel is being ruled, ruled by Rome. There are religious leaders called Pharisees and Sadducees, and there's not much explanation in the Gospels themselves about how and why everything in Israel changed. This is where we can look to some other texts written within that 400 year gap, including some of the Dead Sea Scrolls themselves to help explain the transition between the book of Malachi and the Gospel of Matthew. Until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the best options existing to explain this period were the Jewish history contained in the Talmud, the four books of the Maccabees, and the works of ancient historians such as Flavius Josephus. You know, after I read these books that I read, um, this winter, I came to the realization that I never had before I read the books. And that is we in this movement, in me as well, um, have been ignorant of the Jewish roots of our faith in Messiah. We think that we've been learning Hebraic things, and in many regards we have. But when we uh, endeavor to follow the Torah, we identify in our minds the Torah with what we have before us today, with the, which is Orthodox Judaism, which came from the Pharisees. So in many regards, we're learning their understanding of the Torah, and I've gleaned a lot and learned a lot from their understandings, and it's helped me and my faith, and so there's a lot there to glean, to learn, to understand. However, the Pharisees, um, as a group, did not become believers in Yeshua as the Messiah. It was this other sect that became believers in Yeshua as the Messiah, predominantly the Qumran community, the Essenes, and, and it's from their beliefs came the doctrines that are in our New Testament, the Jewish roots of faith in Messiah. So we have learned um, massively in the last 10, 15, 20 years about the history of Greco-Roman Christianity and, it, and its influence and its history. But I'd like to submit to you that we haven't learned the Jewish side of the history and how things came from David and Solomon into the second century and what happened in the second century up to 70 AD among the Jewish sects and what the conflicts were, what the issues were. We haven't learned that side and we need to learn that side and bring together what we've learned from the Greco-Roman side to have a complete perspective and understanding of our faith in Messiah. 
So do you believe in divine providence? I do. So it was only in 1947 that the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Um, the information contained in there was buried for 2,000 years. So why was it discovered in our generation? Is it for us? So um, Josh Beck in his book says, I hope to lay out the case that the Dead Sea Scrolls were always meant to be discovered when they were for the current generation that the information they offer can greatly help us understand the roots of Christianity much better. You know, the God of Israel has a sense of humor. And so we have this perspective that the Christians need to learn about Torah from us. You know, they're ignorant of Torah and they need to learn about Torah from us. But primarily these books that I've read, you know who the authors are? Christian authors um, that are going to church that are dispensationalists that believe in age of law, age of grace. And they're the ones that's telling us about the history of what happened uh, amongst the Jewish people. And so a God's sense of humor is I have to learn from the Christians <laughs> about the Jewish roots of my faith and Messiah. And so God has these ways to keep us all humble, you know? So in the second century BC, there were three primary sects of the Jews, as Josephus explains, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the historians call them the Essenes. So the Sadducees were linked with the temple. They were aristocratic, wealthy, and influential. The Qumran community was led by the priesthood of the sons of Zadok. And in the community role in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it says, whoever approaches the council of the community, he shall undertake by a binding oath to return with all of his heart and soul to every commandment of the Torah of Moses in accordance with all that has been revealed of it to the sons of Zadok, the priests, the keepers of the covenant and seekers of his will. Then from the Messianic role, it also says, the sons of Zadok are the elect of Israel, the men called by name, he shall stand at the end of days. The sons of Levi shall hold office, each in his place, under the authority of the sons of Aaron, under the authority of the sons of Zadok, the priest. You know, I've been to Israel 14 times, been on, I don't know how many tours, and three or four times I've been to the Qumran area, and they showed me the Qumran area and the mikvahs that are there, but they never told me that that community was led by priests that were the sons of Zadok. And I also learned that they really never... Um, told me, in essence, the history of why they were there and what happened and what they believed. They, they watered it down very large, so we got to go on to the, the, the next sightseeing place. So there, there was a blessing for the Zadok priests. It says, the words of blessing belong to the instructor by which to bless the sons of Zadok, the priests chosen by God to uphold his covenant. These are, the, these are the priests that became believers in Yeshua as the Messiah in Acts chapter 6, verse 7. So the leading Zadok priest in the Qumran community was called the teacher of righteousness. Now this is a term for the Messiah and this is why the leader was known as the teacher of righteousness. The Zadok priests were leaders of the Qumran community and they were waiting for, they were there and they were waiting for the coming of the Messiah. So the Messiah is called the teacher of righteousness. And Joel chapter two, verse 23, be glad then you children of Zion and rejoice in the Lord your God for the Lord has given you the teacher of righteousness and he will descend to you as the rain, as the former and the latter rain in the first month. That refers to the two comings of the Messiah. So the Messiah is called in Hebrew, the teacher of righteousness. James chapter five, verse seven, be patient therefore brethren under the coming of the Lord Behold, the husband waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience until he received the early and the latter rain. Referring to the Messiah as being the teacher of righteousness. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. Sow yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, mercy, break up your fallow ground for it's time to seek the Lord until the teacher of righteousness comes to you. So in the... In the scrolls, it says that the Zadok priests were to be over the community, in Hebrew called the Yahad, the historians called them the Essenes, until the coming of the Messiah. When Messiah comes, then he's going to be 
over us. Now, the Zadok priests were different from the Sadducees. So the Sadducees, if we take the name back to Hebrew, it's, it, it has a connection to Zadoks. Sadducees are the Zadoks. But these ones that called themselves the Sadducees, they were different from the Zadok priest. A distinction should be made between the sons of Zadok of the scrolls um, and the views who, of those who expressed themselves, who expressed in the strict Sadducean Bo Boethusian halakha alluded to in the Mishnah and the Hellenizing Sadducean er, er, aristocracy aristocrats living in Jerusalem in the first century CE. The latter's principles and way of life as described by, Joheph, by Josephus and the authors of the New Testament were quite different from those practiced by the former group. So the Pharisees are linked with the local synagogue and the rabbis. So the Pharisees were birthed out of Babylon. So from the days of David and Solomon the centrality of life was the temple. Everything revolved around the temple and the priests were the teachers in the temple. But now, Nebuchadnezzar comes and takes the Jews into Babylonian captivity. So how are we gonna keep ourselves as a people? We always identified with the temple. How are we gonna keep ourselves um, in exile and not lose our connection of being a people, of being a community and our connection to the Torah? So that's where... Um, the idea came that we're going to have local synagogues. Well, we have to have local people that lead and teach from the synagogue. So that became the rabbis. So the Pharisees came out of, came into being by necessity and created the local synagogue and the rabbis were over them. Now, the Pharisees cared about the common people. And the Pharisees were loved by the common people because they cared about them. But um, the aristocrats, uh, the Sadducees in the temple, um, they didn't care much about the common person and they were neglected. So the Pharisees became rabbinic Judaism. Today, they're called Orthodox Jews. And so the Pharisees had a, a doctrine of oral Torah where they say at Mount Sinai there was a written Torah given and there was an oral Torah given. And you need to go to the rabbis to really know what Torah says because it came down through the oral Torah, which um, they kept. That is what they teach. However, in the original temple system, from the days of David and Solomon, the priests um, that were teachers of the Torah, they didn't have this doctrine of the oral Torah. So ultimately, the Pharisees and the rabbis replaced the function of the priests in the temple to teach the Torah. So of course, if Israel always and only knew um, from David and Solomon, the temple and the priests, the question that would come from the people was, well, wait a second, the priests are the ones that's supposed to teach us Torah. Why should we, we be listening to you? So their answer was, well, because, you know, the, the Torah was given to us because at Mount Sinai there was a written Torah and there was an oral Torah. So it became their explanation of why they should be listened to and why they have authority instead of the priests and the sons of Aaron from the temple. So the Essenes differed theologically with the Pharisees. The Talmud is a body of Jewish texts written by Orthodox rabbis who originally came from the ancient Pharisees in the first century. The Dead Sea Scrolls were written by Jews who completely disagreed theologically with the Pharisees and by extension the Sadducees. So the rabbis diminished the memory of the Qumran community because many in the Qumran community or many of the Essene sect became believers in Yeshua as the Messiah. Now here's another way to phrase it. If you study what the Essenes believe, which I'm trying to, to give you an overview in this session, but I'm gonna go into more detail in my breakout session about the uh, Nazarene's influence on early Christianity. The Essenes were the Pentecostals. And the Pharisees are the Baptists. 
And if you really know anything about Baptist doctrine, they say Pentecostalism has, was done away with. Okay, so the, the, the rabbi said, well, prophecy ended with the days of you know, Malachi because they want it to be ended and they want it to be static and so that now they're gonna interpret what's static. They didn't believe, the Pharisees didn't believe in God's ongoing revelation, that, that he speaks by his spirit in ongoing revelation. Well, the Essene community did. Obviously, those in the New Testament did as well. And if in the, the book of Acts is full of Pentecostalism. Okay, the New Testament is a book of Pentecostalism, you might say. All right? And so that's the easiest way to explain it in Christianese terms, all right? And so the Pentecostals kind of like wrote out from their history, the Baptists, the, the Pharisees, wrote out from their history the Essene Pentecostals. So the question is, is Orthodox Judaism our only Jewish heritage? Many believe Orthodox Judaism is the only real and true representation of our Jewish heritage. However, the Dead Sea Scrolls provide a deeper insight into that understandable but flawed way of thinking. So why was the Qumran community called Essenes? The word Essene probably means pious or holy. So that was the name given to them by historians, by Josephus, uh, by um, Pliny the Elder, and uh, um, by other um, historians. Like I said earlier, there is no mention of the word Essene in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Members of the Qumran community called themselves the Yahad, which means togetherness, oneness, unity. They were, the, they were the one people. So the union of Essene communities throughout the land of Israel is called the Yahad. And the Yahad followed the Torah under the authority of the sons of Zadok. Now, the Qumran community got established because the temple in Jerusalem had become corrupted. And it became corrupted in the days that the Greeks came in and Antiochus Epiphanes IV around 175 BC. And so the non-Zadok Hasmonean priesthood was considered illegitimate. So um, from the days of David and Solomon, because there was a priest by the name of Zadok that was faithful to David, and so from the days of David and Solomon clear through 175 BC or so, uh, when the Antiochus Epiphanes and the Greek came, all the high priests in Israel was from the line of Zadok. And so the Greeks came in and they replaced the high priest. Ultimately, the Hasmoneans took charge over the priesthood. The Hasmoneans are not from the sons of Zadok going back to the days of David. So the Zadok priests believed that the Hasmonean priesthood uh, was not what God had said in the Torah. And so they considered them illegitimate. And so um, they then fled into the wilderness to preserve the truth of the Bible and the truth of the Torah. They were the... Hebraic roots people of their day that was trying to follow God according to how he originally gave it and how he originally did things. So we are given the basic reason for why the Qumran community originally left behind their previous lives in Israel in favor of creating a new society in Qumran. At the time they left, the temple leadership and government had become so corrupt following ungodly desires rather than the will of God, the true believers in God had no choice but to leave. They also believed they were directed to do so by the guiding of the Holy Spirit in order to fulfill the prophecy about being a voice crying in the wilderness and pave the way for the coming of the Messiah. So why did they choose a desolate spot overlooking the Dead Sea? In the Dead Sea Scrolls, the rule of the community tells us why and how they were formed. And when these become members of the community in Israel, according to all these rules, they shall separate from the habitation of unjust men and shall go into the wilderness 
to prepare there a way of him as it is written, Isaiah chapter 40, verse three, prepare in the wilderness the way and make straight in the desert a path for our God. They saw that scripture as their biblical basis of what God was directing them to do regarding their circumstance and their situation. So the path is the study of the Torah, which he commanded by the hand of Moses that they may do according to all that he has revealed from age to age as the prophets have revealed by the Holy Spirit. The group is called to separate from those who are unjust and go to the wilderness in fulfillment of Isaiah's command. Hence the text is saying that the people who had gone to the wilderness, they took this literally, understood Isaiah's words, the way and the path in a figurative sense. They were not commanded to construct a real road, but to study the Torah and in this manner to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. So because they were formed based upon Isaiah chapter 40, verse three, they were known as the people of the way. They were known as the people of the way. The early believers in Messiah were known as the people of the way. So the Yahad called themselves the members of the way. The Yahad is described as those who have chosen the way, 1 Q West 9, 17, and 18, while those who leave the community are those who have turned aside from the way. The Yahad was the perfect way, and they taught the perfection of way. So John the Baptist identified himself with Isaiah chapter 40. He's the voice crying in the wilderness. He identified himself with that verse. And those people. Was John the Baptist a member of the Qumran community? The scholars believe he likely was. And I'm going to show you more information about that in the breakout session. So now notice in Acts chapter 9 verse 2, Paul persecuted followers of the way. He desired to send letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So Paul grew up as a Pharisee, and uh, some believe he was a member of the Sanhedrin, and he was there at the stoning of Stephen. And so, um, who was opposing their belief system? The Essenes that lived throughout Israel, but were in the Qumran, because they had become believers in Yeshua's Messiah. The priests had become believers in Yeshua's Messiah, and Paul was going to uh, come against them because they weren't following the Torah correctly. So Paul identified with being a follower of the way. Acts chapter 24, verse 14. But this I confess to you that according to the way which they call a sect, so worship I the God of my fathers. So Paul then identified himself as being one of the way. So the Essenes were a covenant community. And there was a two to three year period to join the covenant community, okay? You come into the community of the Pharisees by physical circumcision. So the question about that we have in Acts chapter 15. You know how you came into the community of the Essenes? By covenant. You came in by covenant and there was a th two to three year period to join their covenant community. And so it was voluntary. It didn't come just because of who you were born. So in coming into the covenant, the new members had to agree to follow the Torah in order to join the covenant. They had to agree to follow the Torah. And in enjoying the covenant, they had to confess their sins before entering the covenant. They got to confess their sins to join the covenant and it's voluntary. And so they were required in confessing their sins to repent with their whole heart. And they had to demonstrate a circumcised heart, that they really had made this commitment from the heart. And so they believed in a coming Melchizedek Messiah. And this Melchizedek Messiah was based upon Isaiah chapter 61, but they re-saw that the proclamation of liberty came about by the forgiveness of your sins. So a Melchizedek Messiah who would come uh, based upon Isaiah 61, who would forgive you of your sins. 
So here it says in the Dead Sea Scrolls, as Isaiah said, to proclaim the Jubilee to the captives. They are the inheritance of the Melchizedek who will return to what is rightfully theirs. He will proclaim to them the Jubilee, thereby releasing them from the debt of all their sins. So the Melchizedek Messiah will announce salvation based upon Isaiah 52 verse seven. So Melchizedek means king of righteousness, but it's Melech, king, Zedek, Righteousness. I can change the vowels from Zedek to Zadok. It's rendered king of the Zadok priests. So Melchizedek, the Messiah, is the king of the Zadok priests as well as being the king of righteousness. So those that entered into the covenant community, they saw themselves as entering into the new covenant. And they were entering into a new covenant in the land of Damascus, which was a nickname for the Qumran community. And so the charter calls for this new covenant and it's called the covenant of mercy, the eternal covenant, the covenant of peace. So the Yahad understood that time moved in circles. That is why they understood their community as the new covenant, not because the covenant was being annulled, but the covenant was being renewed. They were entering into a renewed covenant and they had to pledge in entering into this new covenant that they were gonna keep the Sabbath and they were gonna keep the festivals. So the new covenant was in the land of Damascus. So it is with all men who entered the new covenant in the land of Damascus. So a nickname for their community was the land of Damascus. It's based upon Amos chapter five, verse 27. And so Paul uh, was going to persecute believers of the way in Damascus. The Qumran was nicknamed the land of Damascus. So another explanation says, and one of their documents is called the Damascus document. So from Amos chapter five, verse 27, um, it says that you will be carried away into captivity beyond Damascus. So they saw themselves leaving Jerusalem, the corrupt temple system. They were going into exile, into the land of Damascus, into the wilderness. And so that's why they saw that they were in the land of Damascus. Now, Damascus can mean house of the blood heir. House of the blood heir. So this new covenant was a covenant of grace and mercy. It says in the Dead Sea Scrolls, he is to induct all who volunteer to live by the laws of God under the covenant of mercy. So this new covenant was to be followed with the help of the Holy Spirit. In the Thanksgiving uh, Psalm, it says, a man's way is not established except by the spirit which God created by him. Damascus document says he caused them to know by his anointing, his Holy Spirit and the revelation of truth and the manual of discipline, but in the spirit of true counsel for the ways of the man of all of his iniquities to be atoned. So they were following, entering into a new covenant, but they were going to follow the Torah by the Holy Spirit under the leadership of the priests of Zadok. So there was blessings for the help of the Holy Spirit. Words of blessing belonging to the instructor. May the Lord grace you with the Holy Spirit. May he grace you with the Holy Spirit and loving kindness. So they desired for counsel from the Holy Spirit. And I, the instructor, have known you, oh my God, by the Spirit which you gave me, and I have listened faithfully to your wondrous counsel by your Holy Spirit. So the new covenant Yahad were to walk and follow Torah by the Holy Spirit and thus produce the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit engenders humility, patience, abundance, compassion, perpetual goodness, insight, understanding, powerful wisdom, resonating to each of God's needs. So Paul talked about, in similar language, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter five. And so in their documents, um, they explain from Daniel that the Messiah is going to be cut off. And that the Messiah is a suffering servant. So um, one of their things at the Qumran was called the suffering servant at Qumran. 
So in their documents, they referred to the Messiah as the Son of God. In the rule of the congregation, it, it describes the time when God begets the Messiah among them, conferring that the royal Messiah could indeed be regarded as the Son of God. This idea came from Psalm 2. The concept of Messiah as a divine being is well represented in the writings of the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls. He will be called the Son of God. He is a great God among the gods, 4Q246. For behold, God leaves his place and descends upon the heights of the earth. And so Messiah is called the Son of God in Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33. So these are some of the Essenes' messianic expectations. So what also was found at the Qumran was called the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. Here's a copy of the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. So in the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, from the Testament of Benjamin 3, the Messiah is a Lamb of God who is sinless. From the Testament of Joseph 19, the Messiah will be born of a virgin. And we only know the Messiah through the Holy Spirit. Those who believe the Messiah will have eternal life. The Messiah is God incarnate from the Testament of Simeon 6. The Messiah will save Israel and the nations, Testament of Simeon 7. The Messiah will be worshiped, Testament of Reuben 6. So the Zadok priesthood Qumran community had a belief system like first century Christianity. The scrolls speak a language that would have been understood by early Christians. And the theology of the Dead Sea Scrolls matches up very well to Christianity. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, theo the theology taught among them mirrors the teachings we find in the Hebrew scriptures and even what would become Christianity. Ancient Jew Jews believe we have a sin nature and are headed in separation from Messiah and our only way out is for the Messiah to come to earth. He would be God incarnate, virgin born, die for us and reconcile us to the Father. This was common knowledge until the Pharisees and the Sadducees of the first and second centuries BC reinvented Judaism. So the Qumran community Jewish faith is theologically different than the Jewish faith of the Pharisees. The Dead Sea Scrolls therefore represent a school of legal thought different from the competing Pharisaic approach. And the Qumran community regarded that they would be in existence until the coming of the Messiah. So the Essenes and early Christians can be explained by having a common tradition, culture, and worldview. And as a result of their belief system, they were able to accept Yeshua as the Messiah, as you can see. So many Essenes became believers in Yeshua as the Messiah. When Yeshua came, died, resurrected, and ascended to heaven, the believing remnant of Essenes likely accepted him, his teachings, and his prophecies. We can see in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, that the priests of Zadok became believers in Yeshua as the Messiah. So the believing Zadok priesthood in the Qumran community, as well as those of the community, became members of the body of Messiah. So the Essenes joined the early church. The reason why the Essenes are not mentioned in the New Testament is simply because they merged in the early church. So the Dead Sea community's theology and practice lived in the early Nazarene Christian church. Yeshua didn't come to start a Gentile Christian church. The historical Yeshua did not intend to create a new religion or a church that excluded Jewish observance or membership. So the Jewish Essene Messianic branch ultimately in time became known as Christianity. And the Jewish Pharisaic branch became known as Judaism. So I'd like to share with you a quote from Dr. Christian Ginsburg writing in 1869. He said, it's very surprising that the Essenes whose exemplary virtues elicited the unbounded admiration of even the Greeks and Romans and whose doctrines and practices contributed so materially to the spread of Christianity should be so little known among intelligent Christians. 
Was the historical Yeshua influenced by the Essenes? Yes. Was the Jesus movement influenced by the Essenes? Yes. Did the early Yeshua movement develop in ideological proximity and relationship to the Essenes? Yes. However, the historical Yeshua did not seem to belong to any particular school of halakhic interpretation. So Yeshua wasn't a Pharisee. He wasn't a Sadducee. He wasn't an Essene. But Yeshua's belief system was similar, but not exactly, to the Zadok priests in the Qumran community in the Essenes. So which belief system aligns more closely with the teachings of Yeshua? There were denominations in the time of Yeshua, but the Essenes happened to have a theology that had the most in common with the teachings of Yeshua. The Essenes already believed many of the things that Yeshua came and taught. So for all these reasons, hopefully now, I've explained to you why it is written that Yeshua would be called a Nazarene. That those who heard what he taught and those who witnessed what he did, they would associate with, with which sect? The Sadducees, the Pharisees, or the Essenes? They would associate him with the Essenes and the, those of the Essenes that became believers, they were called the branches, branch from, and that's where we get the word Nazarenes. They were people the way, because they believed in Yeshua, Yeshua was linked in name to them and with them. And this is the meaning of the prophecy that the prophets testify that he would be called a Nazarene because Yeshua is a branch himself that comes forth from Jesse. And so those who believed on him would be branches as well. And so hopefully now you can have a better appreciation for what I'm describing to you as the Jewish roots of your faith, which goes to the Essene community, those in the Qumran, the priesthood, the sons of Zadok. They are the real Jewish roots of our faith not the Pharisees. Can we learn from the Pharisees? Yeah. Do they have teachings of Torah that we can learn from, glean from, benefit from? Yes. And so can they explain Jewish cultural things that we can learn and benefit from? Yes. So we're not gonna stop learning from um, the Orthodox Jews and what they have to teach and share, their insights um, from the Torah and the cultural things that we can learn. We're not gonna stop none of that because we can greatly benefit from it. However, the Jewish roots of our faith, those who ended up believing in Messiah and had a belief system that is similar to what we practice today and as is contained in the New Testament, came forth from that Essene community, those that called themselves the Yahad, that were led by the sons of Zadok. So hopefully from all of this, you have a greater appreciation, a deeper understanding of who Yeshua is and why he was called a Nazarene. So I pray that you've been blessed and continue to be blessed. Uh, with the things that are uh, going to be here with the rest of the conference. And let's give all praise, glory, and honor to Yeshua because he's the one that deserves all of our praise, glory, and honor. Amen.